Imperial Kongs, Translation Series Number 4. Are these four Imperial Kong isolated anomalies? The only ones of its kind. Kung An Kuo tells us that much of the Analects were taken from old literary monuments which Confucius copied, examined, and arranged. Should there not be at least a few of these monuments to be found in China? It seems that there are, but they have fallen through the cracks left by missing pieces in their history. Since there is no historical narrative to explain the merging of Liangzhou culture motifs with Western Zhou dynasty writing, then these priceless public monuments of classic China may be bought as curiosities on the internet. There are at least seven that I have found being sold from China currently as this video is being made. For those who insist that these are forgeries, I encourage you to order two identical Kongs with the same inscriptions. Forgers would certainly jump at the chance of making an extra buck by just copying the exact same thing. If they are unable to do so, why not? Could the craftsmen who made these Kong have passed away thousands of years ago? The diverse forms, styles, and inscriptions are a giveaway. Forgers are copiers. They are not creators. What are they copying? Here we find the same merging of the two people groups, the same beautiful black nephrite jade, the same layout and forms of Bai Disc and Kong, the same greater seal script inscriptions. Let us think clearly and not prolong the bleeding out of precious artifacts that are now being sold on eBay with free shipping to boot. The inscriptions on the four imperial Kongs were preserved by Confucius in the Analects. Translation for Bird Kong A may be found in the two previous videos. Bird Kong B, Fish Kong, and Spirit Beast Kong, named after the motifs crowning the top portion of the Kongs, contain varying portions of the texts from Analects Yao Ye 1 to 2. The translation for these Kongs will be done altogether as one continuous text containing all inscriptions on the three Kongs. Yao said, Consultation, Yu Shun, heaven's choice for succession rests on your person. Consent to hold on to this center of command. Should there be difficulties and poverty in the land within the four seas, the blessing of heavenly prosperity will forever end. Aside from appearing in the Analex, this quotation may also be found in the classic of history. Emperor Yao and Emperor Shun were two of the five legendary emperors from China's remote antiquity, before the Age of Dynasties. When Yao chose Shun as a worthy successor, Shun tried to nominate others for the job, but Yao insisted that heaven had chosen Shun for this important political and religious position over the land within the Four Seas, China's most ancient name. Therefore, likewise, Shun commanding Yu said, I, the young man dared to walk in his steps. The most insignificant of male creatures was used, daring to be proclaimed into the illustrious position of royal sovereign. The classic of history begins with the books and councils of Emperor Yao, Shun, and Yu, who ruled China in succession. None of these three emperors were related by blood. Their leadership roles were given to them on the basis of their excellent character, outstanding intelligence, and proven abilities. Emperor Yao rejected his own son as heir to the throne, deeming him unfit for the job. During their reigns, the citizens under their rule lived in harmony with their spiritual and physical needs addressed by their sovereigns. The Xia, China's first dynasty, began from the lineage of Yu the Great. After ruling for 470 years, the Xia dynasty was followed by the Shang dynasty that kept its power for almost 600 years until it was conquered by the Zhou dynasty around 1050 BC. Think of these first few lines from the Imperial Kong Sasan introduction using quotations from kings of remote antiquity who had humbled themselves before their subjects, making it clear that they were public servants working hard to prevent pain and poverty. This introduction sets the tone for the rest of the inscription. The text that follows carry the main reason of why these monuments were made by the Zhou dynasty. It begins with an apology. The emperor is at fault, not daring to pardon the emperor's official ministers. 
nor cover up the records in my heart and mind. The character is of bamboo slats tied together for official records. It seems the emperor was disturbed by reports received regarding his official ministers in what they called the 10,000 regions. We personally bear the guilt. Therefore, it is not the fault of the 10,000 regions. Should the 10,000 regions have committed crimes, the fault rests on our person. The character Chen is used in imperial proclamations. By using this character, the emperor establishes that he is speaking in full capacity as head of China. It appears that China and its officers had committed crimes against the 10,000 regions, which we infer to be non-Chinese peoples, since the apology is coming from China. The text implies that the peoples of the 10,000 regions had retaliated evil for evil, committing crimes which the emperor said should no longer be counted against them. The Zhou dynasty has bestowed great improvements that are blessings to the people. Yet we cannot suppose people are virtuous, even if they are from the Zhou dynasty, noble bloodline. Although he regrets the atrocities committed, the emperor makes it clear that the Zhou dynasty has also brought many good things to the people of the 10,000 regions. But he now realizes that leadership positions should be based on more than just being related to the right clan. So, changes needed to be made, and it begins with the emperor. One hundred clans have passed through from me, one person, cautiously weighing capacity, meticulously examining the laws, considering cultivation or termination of public servants. A higher level of leadership selection process was set in place. Thus, the government of the four quarters is to be conducted. Nations that had been wiped out are encouraged to rise, restore families whose lineages had been broken, and lift up the citizens who had escaped. We learn that the war crimes committed included the near extermination of countries and the death of entire generations. Hearts and minds of the subjects in the lands below heaven shall return to us. It is no wonder that those who had escaped would be antagonistic to this colonial government, causing the need to enforce measures to win them back. Note that the countries of the 10,000 regions are in the lands below. On what should we place most importance? Subjects, food, mourning for the dead, ritual sacrifice, and ruling the vast, prosperous land. Number one priority was the citizens who needed rulers to deal with them with righteous justice. Number two, the production and distribution of food. Three was to allow the citizens to grieve for their dead. Four was giving them room for their own beliefs and religion. The fifth was to continue their mandate of taking over the territories and bringing prosperity back home. After setting the priorities straight, the emperor then gives four qualities required for his official ministers. Rulers have the trust of the multitudes. Rulers appoint clever subjects to govern. Rulers achieve good results in public service. Rulers speak, i.e. talk, explain, correct, reprimand. They may have been successful in bringing about change. The Zhou dynasty lasted almost 800 years and was a period of heightened prosperity for the entire nation of China. Unfortunately, we can only imagine the devastation that had been wrought on the nations of the 10,000 regions who may have lost large portions of their own histories and cultural heritage over hundreds of years of colonization. The second half of the translation of these three imperial Kong will be in the next and final video of this series.